It's a real pleasure to have uh, Mr. Kanda Yamkela uh, here from uh, UNIDO. He's also chairing a new special group at the uh, request of the uh, high-level commission uh, at the request of the uh, Secretary General on Energy. And so I think this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Kenny M. Kella is um, a former minister in the government of Sierra Leone and then has had a distinguished career in the UN system. And I think uh, by UN watchers is perceived as a more than a rising, rising star and arrived star uh, in, the, uh, in the UN system. And uh, I think we're very fortunate to have him here um, uh, with us here at CSIS. And I want to uh, recognize our friends at the UN Foundation who are uh, sponsoring, uh, sponsoring uh, help with, uh, with us today, this event, uh, in honor of uh, UN Day, which was on Monday. So we're calling this is sort of UN Week. And so we have a little a small reception afterwards. Uh, so I hope you'll stick around for it. But I think you're going to find this to be a very interesting discussion about uh, energy access in light of the uh, context of Rio Plus 20. Uh, and also in light of some of the challenges that are going on in the world in terms of uh, what's going to happen with foreign assistance and also uh, the, uh, the rise of uh, globalization of, of, of uh, foreign direct investment and the role of the private sector in, in helping to solve uh, these, the challenges that we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over uh, to Candy Mkella. And on behalf of uh, Sarah Ladislaw and myself here at CSIS, we're so pleased to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for Thank you for inviting me uh, to share some ideas with the audience and participants during this Energy Week. Um, it's been a very busy 48 hours for me here, jumping from one discussion on energy to then discussing food security. Uh, spending the day today discussing climate change and sustainable development, so moving back and forth uh, on these issues. I was asked to talk about the role of the UN in promoting prosperity and development. And I was saying to myself, it's very difficult to define these things these days, prosperity and development at a time when the world is still dealing with the debt crisis. And in those of us who live in Europe, you see every day this debt crisis unfolding in more countries being threatened to go under. So what will prosperity mean in that context? Let me try to spend the first 10 minutes of our, my discussion with you on some of the mega trends we see and challenges we see the UN will face, the world will face, and issues the, world, the UN has to address. And I'll spend more time on energy, because uh, central to some of these big challenges we have is the whole issue of how we produce transmit and use energy, and why we see this, and the Secretary General sees this, sees this as the issue for this century that we must address. But here are four or five key issues that uh, we will all be challenged with if we're talking about prosperity and development. The first one is still the unfolding debt and financial crisis. Um, this is still causing a lot of volatility, still causing a lot of challenges for advanced countries, but also for poor countries. The context here is, I can tell you in 2007, 2008, I was in meetings in New York where this crisis had just started. It's a financial crisis, and I watched us from month to month, seeing how fast the crisis was moving from a financial crisis on Wall Street to countries where there were not, in fact, any streets that are paved. So it became a global crisis, and we were all in shock, and the speed with which it was moving. Uh, there was a time in 2008, I was in Cambodia. We were looking at factories in the garment sector, and the Cambodian said, it's not here yet. It's mainly in Bangladesh, because Walmart and others are not buying, because the consumers are not buying. Two months later, it was a different question. It was already in Cambodia. They were looking at laying off people. So this is still unfolding, and we saw how fast it transmitted. So one of the lessons we learned immediately that in the new context, with this interconnection, uh, these things, the contagion effect is, is fast and wide and goes immediately to affect, affect poor countries. So how do we plan in the context of volatility? How does a poor small country plan its 
uh, deal with is fiscal and monetary policy when interest rates are changing, exchange rates are changing, where that country has no control. How do you plan even budget support for those countries? And those are issues in 2008 and even now the World Bank and IMF are looking at. At that time, we used to talk about the food, fuel, and financial crisis, all connected, because energy became an issue immediately as well, high prices of oil. And we had 22 countries on the watch list, and at that time we used to discuss volatility, uh, uh, vulnerability, and viability. Some countries already were having riots, so security issues al already kicked in. So that's still unfolding. Second issue, demographics. We see the demographic challenge as being very serious. In Africa, the projections, I mean, before I even talk about Africa, next week we will be celebrating or commemorating the birth of the seventh billionth child. We will be seven billion. That child will not be born in America, according to the scientists, will be born, born in an emerging economy. I'll talk a little bit about demographics later. But in Africa, we're looking at 1.4 billion Africans, 2030, maybe 2 billion or 2.2 billion by 2050. Most of them young, most of them below 25. They need jobs. Remember, the Arab Spring started in North Africa. Could spread if there is no economic opportunity. But I'll come back to demographics a little bit later. The third one, resource scarcity. This one I picked out of the World Economic Forum. I serve on their Global Agenda Council on Climate Change and when we meet as a global council, 700, 1,000 experts, we are asked to mingle in design groups and different groups. The issue of resource scarcity is real. CEOs are looking at this. All kinds of natural resources. Um, you, some of you know the literature about approaching planetary boundaries. That's a challenge. It's a serious challenge, increasing population, but limits to the availability of natural resources. And of course, the fourth big one, climate change the biggest risk multiplier of all, that will affect indeed food security, water security, and many other developmental issues. The poor will pay the biggest price if we continue uh, business as usual. The fifth I will give you is the illicit economy. We see as states are becoming more vulnerable, particularly the so-called failing states or failed states. They become victims of the underworld. It's easier to go into a country where there is no rule of law and set up shop. So it is of vested interest that we reduce those. But hey, if they're at risk because of the financial crisis, you'll have more failed states. So you begin to see the connections. And if they're impacted heavily by climate change and they don't have resilience and ad adaptation uh, 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 capabilities, they become failed states. These are big issues. The, the UN has to deal with all of those at the same time as we deal with the usual menu of security, stability, improving relationships amongst uh, countries. Go back to demographics. The IMF did a presentation for us, Secretary General and ourselves in March, projecting some of you may have heard me mention this because it's a real issue. That again, they were looking at 20 years from now, 25 years from now, what will be the shifts in production systems and consumption patterns and demand centers? So we're looking at this, they see that about two and a half to three billion people will move to the middle class in emerging economies, mainly in Asia, accounting for probably 40% of consumer expenditure. But you know those two, three billion people, they're going to demand more food, they're going to demand more energy, and more of everything, because they're moving up, income is going up. And so one key conclusion they have is the days of cheap food are gone. And it's not just any food, they would want protein, that's the normal trend. Your income goes up, you go for more proteins, away from starch and others. Now what would be the implication for the poor countries? Can they afford food? Would the food be available at a time when we're talking about resource constraints on land, water, and then climate change, the big uh, uh, risk multiplier, and of course energy. There will be a huge demand for energy, which means there could be, I'm not saying there will be, there could be, more emissions, hence more problems with climate change. So you begin to see the interconnections. But a lot of these people will also move into cities. Ah, urbanization. So new urban settlements, new additional waste management issues for municipalities. You need new 
mass transit systems, if they continue the same consumption patterns as you and I have done, we don't have enough space. We don't have enough materials. So we talk in that context about sustainable production consumption. We need a lot of changes, given these demographic projections and where the purchasing power would be and what will happen going forward. So we'll, we talk a lot within the UN these days about sustainable production and consumption systems and sharing best practices, how we will cope with this. This is not just about climate change. This is the reality of demographics and some of these structural changes we cannot stop. Um, with that, let me transition a little bit to energy. So you ask the key questions, OK, with all of these issues, what kind of global governance systems would we have? What will be the role of the UN? Where do you transact these issues as they now converge? Because they're not isolated anymore. You know, you look at a case of energy when the United States and other OECD countries were industrializing. And people have looked at this from the beginning of the, the Industrial Revolution to now. And they've just tried to average out in the world, new energy, uh, world energy outlook. Let's say energy price, roughly on average for all that period, 25 uh, dollars per barrel for oil. The developing countries and emerging economies will do their own transformation when oil is $100 a barrel. So the days of cheap oil, what does that mean for them? What does it mean for poor countries when energy hits that level? I put this map up. I don't have my, my pointer. So as we are we're going to talk about global governance and what can be done. We chose, and that's part of my leadership within the UN, on behalf of the Secretary General to say, fine. Let's take one of these issues. And we are convinced that central to the issues we're going to be dealing with on sustainable development is energy. 64 to 70% of emissions come from energy systems, energy production, transmission, and use. So you can't solve climate change without dealing with energy. It will just be a dream. If you look again also at poverty, countries need energy to propel growth in their economies. Should they use the old fossil technologies? If you and I say, oh, they should be holier than thou, then what technologies do they use? Is it affordable? Who finances? There's always an incremental cost when you go to the cleaner technologies. Who pays that incremental cost? So again, growth, poverty, the energy linkage. But more importantly, some argue, uh, uh, Jeremy Rifkin, recently in his new book, The Third Industrial Revolution, he argues the real trigger of the financial crisis and the debt crisis is energy, when energy hit $147 a barrel. All of you paid attention in the US. The, he believes, and some other scientists, that was the real trigger to show how vulnerable our economy is. And he's predicting that it's a five-year cycle. There is a crisis. Demand goes down. Prices drop of oil and energy. Suddenly, it picks up again. Demand picks up. It goes up. And they believe this cycle will repeat each time, and it will go back to above $100 a barrel. And then we'll have problems again. So we picked energy. So let's take energy and see how we act, take action on this as the UN and the global community. How can we rally the world around energy issues, looking at availability and equity issues within energy, looking at climate change, and then shared responsibility? I show you this map. This is a satellite map from, um, from NASA at night. That's Africa, very dark, everywhere else, bright. But you see a little bit also darkness in Asia, and some, some again in Brazil. That's how it is today. Somebody's going to flip this for me, or there's a, a, OK, right here. Energy poverty. This is the data, current data, from um, the International Energy Agency, the open circles the level of energy poverty in different continents as it stands, Africa, with about 587 million people without access to electricity. Asia, India, about 600 million, some say 400 million. And then the, the field in circles, that's their projection by 2030. Bottom line, their projection, this is 2011, World Energy Outlook, there will still be 1.3 billion people not connected. Business as usual scenario. In addition, we know today about 2.73 billion 
use biomass for cooking and their primary energy needs. Projection, that number will still be 2.8 billion by that time. Energy poverty, they also happen to be the poorest of the poor. So I said India, 400 million in India. Question is, are there new approaches to solve this problem? Because it's also a social problem. We estimate 1.5 to 2 million people die every year. Premature deaths from indoor air pollution, most of them women and children. So it's a social problem. It's more than malaria. The projection for 2030 is that other diseases might drop, but the deaths from indoor air pollution will be more than HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. So it is a health and social problem. You can look at some of the work on this indoor air pollution from Kirk Smith at the University of Berkeley. He's done a lot of this work with uh, WHO. How do we make energy access a priority in the development discourse? It's not been an issue in the, in the UN. We don't talk much about energy. Typically, we attach energy to other issues, sustainable development, climate change. The reason is, each time energy comes up, there is a fight. It's about the geopolitics of energy. Who will control the supply? We change the narrative. Let's talk about energy for development. And that's the narrative we're using here. Yeah? How do we mobilize action? How can the UN lead action and get countries to rally around it? How do we finance? And then how would we have accountability? And so this is an area where we're going to be, the Secretary General has made it clear for his second time, sustainable development is the issue, and for sure, uh, energy within that. This again is from the International Energy Agency, projections of global energy mix, as they see it. Natural gas playing a big role. I think Fukushima has helped. You can see this period. Fukushima has helped a lot. There's a lot of shifts. Some people are calling this the golden age of gas as a transition fuel. But this is where we want to go. We want to increase the share of renewables. Very small. So to improve this mix, to decarbonize energy systems. How can we promote access and at the same time introduce these te new technologies? so that more people have access, but at the same time, we solve climate change as well. How do you do all of this and transact and get buy-in when you have a political system now where they're still made everywhere? Even in the US, you can have an easy discussion on climate change or energy policy here. Again, balancing energy security, energy access, and then dealing with climate change. Secretary General therefore decided to launch, it's the only new initiative he's introduced at the General Assembly this year, an, an initiative on sustainable energy for all. He's asked me and also Chad Holliday, Chairman Bank of America, to lead this group. We've set up a very high-powered group, 35 people, most of them from the private sector, only three of us from the UN. Because the capital we need for this, $48 billion a year, is not from aid. So again, you have a big debate now. Where do you get the money? Where do you get that 48 billion? It's not from aid money. Aid money is a share, but it's mainly leveraging from the private sector. Hence, this group is heavily dominated by companies that are technology providers, by bankers and others. How do we leverage that cash and then the R&D support we need to drive down the cost of renewables? Our, our remit is to develop an action agenda. How do we can we set some political goals and then develop a strategy and action agenda to achieve those goals and have an accountability framework and then launch that agenda in Rio Plus 20? That's our remit in that group. Already we have defined three goals to achieve universal access to energy by 2030. We want to double the share of renewable energy in the energy mix. In fact, some of us have a number. We say make it 30% renewables. Now that's easier said than done. And it's very political. And then we say double the rate of improvement of energy efficiency per year. That translates to about 40% improvement in energy efficiency by 2030. That's tough. Our argument is you've got to do all of this. You've got to make poor people have access. That's about equity and growth and their own uh, um, access to prosperity. Yeah. But you've got to do these two things if we want to lower emissions, if we want to be sustainable. Yeah? So how do you combine all of this and get the world to rally around? So first of all, we've defined political goals. These are not binding, because that's the problem in the negotiations. 
in climate negotiations, nobody wants binding targets. We're saying, fine, let's have aspirational goals. Can we set some key norms and principles as a global community that we should do this? It covers equity. It also covers climate change and uh, sustainability issues. So we have established this, and the question is now, how do we achieve them? And that's the job this, this high-level group is going to do to develop an action agenda. Some people have said to me, well, if you're advocating for more access, you're advocating for more power generation, and you're pushing for coal-fired plants, and the world is going to go to hell if all these people have electricity. Well, again, we went to IEA. We say, you do the heavy lifting. Do the analysis for us. Without these, connecting these 1.4 billion people who have zero access, this will still be your demand globally. Because these developing countries need energy. Now, what if we were to connect those? Just increases demand by 1.1%. It's negligible. Yeah. But what happens to emissions? Without these folks, you still have high emissions because it will be business as usual. People will build those coal-fired plants. You can tell them not to have it. If some of us have enjoyed it two, three hundred years, others need it too. So you can't stop them. They may use nuclear, they may use something else, but they'll do it anyway. So we say, well, what if we were to say we give these 1.4 billion people existing fossil technologies? By how much will it increase emissions? Negligible. So the whole issue of climate change is not an excuse not to have that equity, not to have these people access energy so they can have prosperity. But we don't want them to use the old technologies if we can avoid it. We want to help them leapfrog. We want them to use those renewable sources, but they're expensive. Who pays the incremental cost? Is the technology available? How do you deploy it to scale, not pilot projects? How do you deploy it to scale? Not easy. This is not government aid. This is about business models that will convince private sector to really bring that cash, that 48 billion, but use sustainable sources rather than the traditional sources of energy. Can they leapfrog? Well, if the US cannot easily increase the share of renewables in their own mix, how can we preach that to, to poor countries? They don't have the technology yet. So what capacity building, what kind of public policies will make that happen? So you saw the three goals. In our action agenda, we are already know, identifying that in access, finance is going to be a key issue, key issue there. How do we bring in private sector to provide that finance? So we have a group looking at finance, and for sure, we have Chad Holliday. He's a big banker in this country. And uh, so he will be helping us in that group with some other people from around the world. We want to do these other climate-related, if you will, uh, uh, goals, the kind of R&D you need, the same issues arise here, the public policy that will incentivize using more uh, 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 energy sources that are less carbon intensive. Some people say the promising one could be a bridging fuel, can be natural gas. We have an aspiration, more renewables, but we need a pathway to go there. Energy systems take several years to design. They take several years to put on the ground to finance. How do we bridge that gap? Some people say natural gas. So I picked one of the simple ones. And again, I picked these numbers from IEA. So well, what about if we say, let's look at clean cooking solutions for that 2.7 billion? Because we know those technologies. Unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Clinton, in fact, is leading that crusade in the uh, clean uh, 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 cook stove alliance. And you know, if you I'll talk about that a little bit. You see how much the world is ready to Tackle, with some, tackle some of these things, the kind of partnerships we're talking about building. If we take providing modern cooking energy solutions to the poor, we need about 74 to 100 billion. Part of that money can go into LPG, yeah? liquefied petroleum gas. We can easily, quickly connect 220 million. And why that's small? Because we're saying, you know, it's more the people in the urban centers that can use this quickly. You can do the distribution systems. But by the time you extend to rural areas, you can have many more. This is not rocket science. It's not. This is done in many countries now, but it's still not available to most other people. And so you can also reduce 2 million premature deaths, possibly, because now they have modern cooking facilities. You save women and children 20 hours per week in some countries from collecting firewood. Again, 
financing? How do you leverage that? What are the business models? Because these are household solutions. How do you incentivize that, that you have the systems in the countries to make it available? So this was my advertisement to the oil and gas group. I said, can you help us? So it's good for your business. It's good for the MDGs. It's good for the climate. But this is where I spend a lot of time. This is where you begin to look at social justice, security, and so on. This is from Foreign Policy Magazine, March 2010. That's a picture they had looking at the Niger Delta. How many of you see young faces here? How many young people have heard of Niger Delta in Nigeria? For me, this article in Foreign Policy Magazine begins to connect social justice, energy justice, climate justice. I worked in Nigeria. This is the Niger Delta. See the darkness all around? That's gas flaring. That's about three, four billion dollars a year. Burnt. Because it's easier to do it. The kids don't have electricity, so they're playing soccer around the gas flaring. That's been going on for 45 years in that region. When I arrived in Nigeria in 2000 to work there as a UNIDO rep, they were having some rebellion there already, kids agitating. And I remember sitting with some Nigerian ministers and uh, generals. I said, you know something? This little, they called it little rebellion. This little rebellion can lead to a civil war. They say, nah, we are not like you Sierra Leoneans and Liberians. That will never happen. We have a strong army. We'll crush them. I say, really? Fast forward. Ten years later, it's a full-blown rebellion. It's about natural resources. But it's more than that. The air is polluted. The water is polluted. The soil is polluted. They don't have electricity. This is being flared 45 years. In the North Sea, you don't flare gas unless it's technically necessary. In Algeria, you don't flare gas unless, it's, unless it is technically necessary. Or oh, LPG is everywhere, even in the rural communities. But yeah, Sub-Saharan Africa. It's burnt. Not piped to the homes, not used for power generation, flared, 45 years. But worst of all, UNEP had a report now, this year, about the level of pollution. Some of us knew that. Greenpeace, everybody has accounted. The pollution in that area is equal to or more than Exxon Valdez, when I was a student here. Now, rebellion, bad corporate practices, social injustice, instability. You fast forward. I mentioned this the last time I was visiting here. This year, my representative in Nigeria is sitting here. Well, terrorists bombed the UN office. You remember I told the Nigerians this thing could spill over? We don't know who did it. Some people say it's the Islamists. Well, just think about it. The poor Islamists in the north, combining forces with the poor, disenfranchised those in the south, you have chaos. So again, we begin to link. And yesterday, I talked about this with the group, what do you call it? The Future Energy Coalition, right? John Podesta and all of these people were there. There was an admiral in the room. He said, I have better pictures for you. See, because I'm using it with some generals now to talk about development and security. And he has different pictures from mine showing the settlements and so on and where the rebels are in the same region. He said, thank you for raising it. It's an admiral from the US Navy. So again, you begin to see the linkage, energy, poverty, climate change, security, and so on. So what we've tried to do in conclusion, we've picked this. This is risk taking now. As I tell you, energy is a sensitive subject. We're going to lead it, but Chad Holiday is a good businessman. Uh, we have CEOs from Vestas, from Sunt, Vestas, largest sol uh, wind power company, uh, 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 Suntech, largest solar PV producer in the world. We have Munich Re, going to have somebody from the Department of Energy here, State Department. These are real issues. These are not trivial. If you're talking about food security, you need an energy source to add value. Yesterday, that was the subject of our presentation at the International Food Policy Research Institute. Ah, gender empowerment. It is the women and children who suffer the most when you have lack of energy. It is the women who collect that firewood, who go down to the water to bring to the uh, water side, to bring the water to the, to, the, to the house to cook. And guess what? pollute themselves in the process, and many of them die. So you look at the centrality and what we're trying to do now with the leadership of the Secretary General to lead this, take it to Rio, put the partnerships together, like the Clean Cook Stove Alliance. Mrs. Clinton backed it, but you have a number of companies. When they started, I think, what, 20, 20 entities today? It's over 100.
pledges. Dow Corning, you name all these companies. They see it as a social issue, but it's not a gift. We're looking at business, but what kind of R&D to make these stoves available? University of Colorado, all of these guys are involved. The best technologies, just to make that simple technology available to women and children quick in communities. How do you build a market for that? Maintenance, supply, so that it's not charity. People make money in the supply chain. Here again, it's a clever use of aid combined with private capital and knowledge to create a market for a simple solution that has both social and economic implications. We're going to use the same kind of model. For me, in conclusion, that's the kind of new leadership we're looking for in the United Nations. The problems are too complex. They're converging too fast. You don't have the luxury anymore of saying, I deal with only the, the rebellion in Darfur. In the same Darfur, you have to take care of the women who are raped when they go to fetch firewood. In the same Darfur, you have to deal with the deforestation that is taking place when refugees move, or if they move over to neighboring countries. These issues are converging. They are not separate. And in a poor country, they don't have that luxury anymore. To choose between climate ah, and poverty, no. It's all at the same time, because climate is affecting poverty same time, and the governments have limited budgets. But ODA shrinking in this debt crisis, how do you leverage private finance? I didn't give you much solutions, but I gave you some ideas of, at least in one case, how we deal with it. There's another group looking at water. There's another group looking at food security. The key is, how do we combine those efforts because they're all interconnected? But we have groups looking at them. My job is to lead this one, which is perhaps even more difficult and more politically difficult to transact. Thank you very much. <laughs> Candy, th Candy, thank you very much. Uh, that was just tremendous. And uh, I think what you, uh, what I'm taking away from this is about new models of use combining development resources along with leveraging private sector resources uh, to solve these problems. It's not about charity and it's not about handouts and that we have to bring the private sector in, but we have to bring the private se sector in not as a charitable player, but as in a way in which they're making money. And that we talk a lot about sustainability. We talk a lot about scale in the development business. We, if we want to achieve scale, we want to achieve sustainability, it's going to have to look uh, in, uh, in like models that is the way you are depicting them in, in your presentation. So thank you very much. I'm going to ask my colleague Sarah Ladislaw from the Energy Program to respond, and then we're going to open it up uh, for some questions. Sarah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for such wonderful and compelling comments. I think you've touched on what not only uh, a lot of the things that we focus on in the energy program here at, at CSIS, but some, what a lot of our colleagues focus on. As we were talking before, before your remarks, we've got groups that focus on food security and water issues and global health issues and demographic issues. And indeed, it's getting more and more complex for us to be able to sort of deal with them as a package. But the thing I wanted to sort of take the opportunity to ask you a question on is you are in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, we do have sort of a, a self-absorbed kind of quality uh, to a lot of the discussions we look at, even on a global basis. And I thought you did a very good job of, of, of couching for a D.C. audience the idea that you know, even though there's a global economic crisis going on, even though we've got sort of a fiscal austerity and budget discussions going on here, that there is a broader global community that is looking at some of these challenges and that they're looking forward to major events like Rio Plus 20 next year, like the Secretary General's mm -hmm. initiative, Energy for All, for All of Next Year. And one of the things that I wanted to, to, to ask you to talk a little bit more about, if you could, before we open up to questions from the audience, is this idea that we've got prevailing here is that without some sort of globally binding treaty, with the failure of global climate change talks and those types of things, that these types of conversations, that reducing emissions, that private sector activity to make uh, to make waves both on the energy poverty side but also on the emissions reductions or the energy efficiency side are really, uh, are, are really doomed and, and that we don't necessarily have a path forward for that. How do you see in very concrete terms the outcomes that may or may not come from the end of the climate change negotiations before the end of the Kyoto Protocol at the end of this year and, and sort of the relationship between what you're trying to tee up from Rio and both in the political sense but also in the practical sense. You know, how do we get uh, uh, folks that feel like we've, we've gotten a, a one-two punch on being able to deal with these uh, issues effectively um, over that hurdle and thinking about them in new ways, in new ways that help us uh, f 
feel like those goals are achievable? We, we must support the formal negotiating processes. These processes were created by member states, not by the UN. Member states defined how they want the UNFCCC to conduct its negotiations in a very inclusive way. So it was their prescription to have 190 something countries around the table. It is up to them to change the format. So my first comment would be, we have to respect and support those processes. And if they're done inclusively, transparently, you get a level playing field and you get commitments from everybody and trust is built. It's not easy to do, but that was the intention. And so we continue to support that and hope that we do get the grand deal that, that we expect. Meanwhile, some of us are convinced that on energy, we don't need to wait. If we say we wait for a grand deal, then it is basically saying to poor people, you perish. We continue to pollute and wait till we get a grand deal. That's not equity. That's not fairness. Because those who are the worst affected now, particularly in Africa, they will pay in all the projections we see, they will pay probably the highest price if we have business as usual. So by not having a deal and telling people to wait till you bring these kinds of solutions, I talk about does not augur well for a secure and safe world. I think that it is in our collective interest to see that these solutions are spread. And that's what we are trying to do, to say, fine. As we negotiate, we know there are things we can do now and today. We know the solutions are there. What we want to do is what new financing models, business models we can do to deploy these solutions to scale. I always say we want to avoid just shining a light on poverty. You know, you put a few solar panels and you come home and say, hey, give a light to Candace Village. That's not enough. We want energy that changes their lives, their productive capacities, e expands economic prosperity for them. Otherwise, we are all not safe. What do you do with all these people? We're waiting for the negotiations to finish. Meanwhile, the populations are growing, moving into cities. You will have instability. And that was the connection with failed states. When you have failed states, nobody is safe. So our message is negotiate, respect the processes, but you know something? Let that not be the excuse of not taking action. But the question is, what action? Can we show some? We are trying to show that on the in the energy space. You can show that in the food security space. Because part of that demographic figure suggests that we need to increase food production by 50% by 2030. I think 70% by 2050. We've got to feed those people. So yesterday we spent time on agribusiness. Again, there are solutions in the United States that we've used in other places that can help answer that question as well. If you look at agribusiness, food security, job creation, value addition, and wealth creation in an economy, as you have done here successfully. We have some microphones here. I'm going to uh, collect questions World Bank style, and so we'll, get, uh, we'll gather a couple questions, and I'll ask people to identify themselves. And if you can frame your question in the form of a short question, that would be um, ideal. So I'm going to start with my friend Tony Carroll up front here. And if there are others, if they'd uh, raise their hand so I can see if you have other questions. I didn't know what to expect when I came here, and congratulations on a terrific presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, my name is Tony Carroll, and I um, am a partner in Manchester Trade, but I also teach at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And um, I've been reading with great interest in the last year or two uh, the work of Michel Severino. And he talks about, uh, articulates quite a bit on this urban migration issue in Africa. And some of his conclusions are different than yours. Okay. He thinks that uh, urban migration will allow for more efficient delivery of services, including energy. Uh, that depopulating rural areas will allow for the first time increase in scale of agri agricultural production. That in effect there will be a, you know, a green revolution, but it will part because of the greater ability of being able to produce scale agriculture. And thirdly, he thinks that there will be so social upliftment because of the more concentration of service delivery mechanisms apart from just energy. And lastly, if you go back to Professor Lewis and the idea of surplus labor, that Africa's moment has come, that this is Africa's time because nowhere else has it achieved such a surplus of labor. And that will inure to the benefit of Africa's potential as an industrial, industrialization and other productive economies. So slightly different than your uh, thesis here, but there are elements there that touch upon your predictions, and I'd just sort of like to get your 
comment upon those? Yes, my comment is I am sure he gave some provisos because I fully agree with him. It could be a demographic dividend. That's what they call it in Vietnam and in India. They're looking at those demogra demographic transitions as a dividend. Conditions are the following. Provided they are skilled, then it's a benefit. Provided you have the infrastructure in place. Ah, provided you have an area, a sector that will absorb. The problem with Africa, that rural urban migration and those demographics are preceding structural change. That's the crisis point. And lack of skills. Unskilled, poor, illiterate people packed in a city, not enough water, not enough light. Ah, but you don't also have the supply structure to supply the food. I was a minister before, trade and industry, dealing with rice, petroleum, flour, and all the essential products. Let me tell you. When you know the riots will begin tomorrow morning, you import food immediately. You don't wait. But that kills local production. So this, for Africa, the challenge is that this is happening too fast, too soon, before you have the structural change in the economies and the infrastructure and skills base to absorb that labor. In Vietnam, in India, they're looking at it. In fact, uh, uh, the former trade and industry minister of India was a friend of mine. He wrote a book. He said, India's time. And he's counting on that demographic transition, that we will have the skilled labor force to be the powerhouse of industry. So let's educate those Africans with the right skills. Then I agree with Siverino. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Gentleman back there. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name is Andrew Gisselquist. I do a little bit of electricity consulting here in town for a firm called Boston Pacific Company, and I also uh, do some consulting for a firm, Ian Co., who's done for about the last 20 years uh, investing in small-scale entrepreneurs around the world uh, and helping uh, investing in them and then training them for business skills so they can then promote uh, clean energy in their communities. And so I was very interested to hear you talk about financing these initiatives, yeah. and I'd just like to get a little more detail from you about what sorts of energy projects you're looking to finance or maybe focusing on finance. And are you talking more about grid scale, larger um, projects, whether they be fossil fuel or renewable energy? You mentioned Vestas as a partner, the big uh, wind turbine uh, developer. Or are you talking more uh, maybe smaller scale, uh, small medium enterprises, local entrepreneurs? Just if you could give some sort of direction there. If at all. Thanks. It's good to know that you work for Christine Epsinger. She's in the group. <laughs> She is supposed to help us with some of those bottom-up solutions. In fact, I was just grilled heavily at State Department now about those models. Is it just top-down, grid-based, or will we look at decentralized bottom-up solutions as well? It's both. Countries need both. Uh, and so Christine, we're working very closely with Christine um, to look at these bottom-up solutions that you guys have worked on. Congratulations. We know some of your models. She'll be in. However, again, when you're looking at scale, for you to get the kind of, I mean, in Africa, we, we, we have a target adopted two months ago in South Africa by the African ministers of energy to add another 40 gigawatts in the next five to six years. Yeah? If you're looking at that level of scale, you need a clear top-down solution. You need a plan that gives confidence to companies to come in for independent power production. They need confidence that you have a, a reform of your power uh, 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 distribution systems. Uh, some of those utilities are, are money, money wasters or money draining uh, institutions. So you need a whole sector reform to get that confidence to come in. But what we are advocating in the group, and that's why we have Christine and others in the group, to have an integrated solution, top down, bottom up. Because the challenge is, if you say you wait till you have the plan ready, sometimes it takes three, four years. <laughs> Meanwhile, there are these models we know that you can do some things now with bottom-up solutions, mini-grid, one megawatt in a community. They can pump water. They have solar panels. And so, so we're saying we don't wait till the plan is finished and we find the 300 million. We have solutions now that are worth only three, three, three million, and we can do it. So bottom-up, top-down. And so I was challenged at state now, so Kande, when will you have a template ready? So, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm putting the experts together and integrating these because the, the communities are also separate. The big utility guys want the grid-based solutions. But you have others saying, hey, there are other ways to do this. So my job is to bring them together and say, OK, give us an integrated plan that does not leave people out while they wait. Because even to do those plans, based on what we know from the World Bank, 
to design some of those systems, you need five, twenty million dollars just to get the plan done and do the environmental impact assessments and then the financial package three, four years minimum before you even begin. Should people wait? My, my friend Bob Berg up in the front here. Thank you very much. Um, I've been senior advisor to four different parts of the UN over my career, so I won't ask you the question in my heart, which is how can <laughs> we get this kind of dynamism throughout the system, but the, the, uh, the question I will ask you is this. Um, uh, you pointed to uh, the need for m more complex approaches, uh, like the Peace Building Commission, uh, for areas like Darfur and so forth. So I wonder if you could spell out a little bit what you'd like to see happen in the more political and development nexus in the way of uh, more complex and uh, more, more uh, systemic solutions guided by the UN. Thank you. Wow, that's the soft and difficult part of the UN. Um, I was looking today, somebody says the, the purpose of the UN is to maintain international peace and security, develop friendly relations amongst nations, promote social progress, better living standards and human rights. Holy cow, all of that. Tough, easier said than done. And then I saw somebody else describing it to say, well, the UN was not created to take us to heaven. It was created to save, us, save ourselves from going to hell. Because all of the violations of human rights <laughs> is like hell. Climate pollution, and if the catastrophic scenarios are true, that's climate hell. How can the UN save you and me from doing wrong things? Because we do have a proclivity to do the easy and the wrong ones. My dear friend, I dodge that part of the UN. I like the technology side of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an economist, so I spend time with these engineers now, electrical guys like this, and they say, you economists, you create all the problems. With technology, it's cause and effect. So I spend more time there. However, however, that is perhaps the most important part of the UN, keeping the peace. To keep peace, you need trust. You need confidence building. You need dialogue. When people feel left out of any system and they lose hope and dignity, you get chaos. How you maintain that? In the context I described before, with financial crisis, money not flowing anymore, with other grievances that I imagine, it's very tough in this context. Uh, we have to finance a number of activities. How do you create the dialogue in an atmosphere where the world has disappointed poor countries by not finishing Doha? Remember, we had a slogan, trade your way out of poverty for six years. We cannot even agree on a trade deal. And in the middle of that, now we've come with a climate deal. Well, my dear friends, if you have been polluting for so long and you cannot even help me trade my way out of poverty, how can I trust you now to help us save ourselves from climate hell? Very tough. We know you need more dialogue. We know excluding people from dialogue is not the answer. Uh, Churchill used to say, let's jaw jaw, let's not war war. Tough to do, takes time to transact, 192. But again, we do believe that we begin to see mechanisms evolving. When the financial crisis hit, G20. Let's face it, it worked. They stopped the crisis. Ah, but it's for that period. But you don't just solve the problem for two years, as we see now. It continues to unravel. How do you institutionalize and begin to implement some of the principles? Uh, you, you should see some of the key principles in the Pittsburgh meeting of the G20, enunciated by these countries of what the responsibility we all have. The role of the UN is to bring those kinds of principles back into the system, to say, can we as an, an international community, a community of nations, can we agree on certain norms? You need it in peace, you need it in human rights, but you know you also need it in natural resource exploitation. We cannot afford for part of the world to say, we continue to consume as we do. We continue to pollute as we do. You solve your own problem, but we are not changing lifestyle. If you slow yours down, then it's okay. You need a place to transact that. I don't know anywhere else. You can have other mechanisms to implement faster. 
You can have other mechanisms to find the solutions quick, but it's good you bring it back to the community of nations. We all need to take them up as solutions. Some people prefer to say, well, let's do bilateral. In the case of pollution, it's transboundary. Carbon has no passport or nationality. It's carbon. Same with other pollutants. So I guess I dodged your question. It's difficult, but that's one of the key important work of the UN. We're looking at it. Uh, we have the Human Rights Commission. We're building all these kinds of institutions. But we all have to agree to the same norms and standards. That's where it begins from, defining those values that we all hold dear uh, 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 and will promote around the world. So equity, fairness, human rights, and uh, transparency, and uh, no double standards. End it there because we have a reception in the back, and so I'd like you all to join me in thanking.